Okay, welcome everybody to, um, to this discussion meeting overview. Um, so on behalf of the research section committee of the RSS, I'd like to thank the authors, uh, Steen van Stielandt and Oliver Jukes for agreeing to, to give this uh, presentation. So it's, it's intended to be a, a gentle introduction to the paper we'll hear uh, this afternoon. Um, OK, so, so I understand the speakers will switch halfway through um, and that will be a good opportunity for questions. Uh, so if, if you have any questions, um, please use the, the raise hand icon um, or, or you could indicate in the chat that, that you have a question and I'll, um, I'll approach you. Um, and then finally, um, if you could all mute if you're if you're not speaking so that we avoid any feedback. Um, OK, so if if you're ready, Steen, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Do you see the slides now? Yes, we do. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, thanks so much for the opportunity to present this work. We've chosen to already go through the talk in in some level of detail, but we'll spend quite a bit of time in this demo session on uh, the motivation of the work and also the theoretical backbone, which is uh, relating to targeted learning or device machine learning theory. So let me start with the introduction. Uh, statistical models obviously play a very dominant role in data analysis, and we use them for different purposes. We use them on the one hand to summarize information in the data so that hopefully we can communicate that in a simple way to other investigators. At the same time, we use models also to address the course of dimensionality. That is, there may be a need to control for confounding, for instance, in the analysis. And in that case, we might like to do the analysis within certain strata, but in a given stratum, there may be so little information, uh, so few subjects that we would like to borrow information across strata by relating to certain smoothness assumptions, and models are really helpful for that. So clearly models have been very successful in practice. If you look at the ease in modeling the effects of continuous exposures or, or interactions in, in generalized linear models, this is one of many examples, I think, where, where you can see how much flexibility models offer us. Or if you look at how easy it is to develop insight into complex correlation structures in generalized linear mixed models, that's another convincing example, I think. But in spite of this, statistical models have also been much the subject of critique, especially in, in recent years. And I'm going to go through five critiques. The first one was named Occam's Dilemma by Leo Bryman. That is, it's very common that we use one and the same model on the one hand to summarize the information in the data, and on the other hand to represent the actual true data generating mechanism. And these are very competing uh, purposes. These are different purposes. Um, and it can leave us torn between on the one hand going for a relatively simple model that is easy to interpret, and on the other hand going for a hopefully correct model that is potentially complicated. You may have experienced in practice uh, the difficulty in making choices as to whether include interactions or non-linearity in a data analysis. On the one hand, the data may have suggested that there is a need for interaction or non-linearity uh, in order to control for confounding bias, but perhaps uh, eventually you chose not to include those or accommodate those because that would only make the message more difficult to communicate to subject matter experts. Now, these compromises uh, are very likely to give uh, rise to model misspecification, and that may eventually lead to bias in effect estimates. You might think that we could make use of residual diagnostics or goodness of fit checks to help us out and understand if there is evidence of model misspecification. But in, in actual fact, it may very well be that those techniques are not sufficient and that we may well not be aware of model misspecification. And the pictures here try to give you an indication of that. You can see um, two times the same data cloud. This is artificial data on an outcome. 
we have one covariate and there are two treatment groups. We have black people mostly sitting on the left. We have red people mostly sitting on the right. These could be two treatment groups. I'm showing you the results of fitting two models. On the left hand side, you can see linear models that allow for uh, effect modification. On the right hand side, you can see the result of fitting a nonlinear model. These two models would be very difficult to distinguish based on the observed data. In fact, they both fit the data reasonably well, but you can see that they lead to rather drastically different conclusions. On the left hand side, we would conclude perhaps evidence of a difference between the two treatment groups, whereas on the right hand side, there's not, not really an indication of that. And the reason why this happens um, is really because we are making extrapolation. The red people are mostly sitting on the right, and so we can only guess what's happening for them on the left. And likewise, the, the black people are mostly on the left, so we can only guess what would happen for them on the right. Uh, these differences is not what, what we will learn from residual checks. And so this, this type of extrapolation, though very common, may very well be hidden in practice. In practice, we would make use um, Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm uh, getting the wrong point. Uh, so model may specification, uh, let me just expand a little bit on that. Uh, may also induce excess variability. So it's not only effect estimators that are affected, but also standard errors may be affected because model misspecification often gives rise to heteroskedasticity that is not reflected or not accounted for in the usual standard errors that we report. Sandwich standard errors address this, um, but they're first of all really the default choice, and even those can be overly optimistic because they often assume that certain parts of the model are correctly specified. And one rather convincing example I, I find that is suggested in these papers by Mark van der Laan is a generalized estimating equation, which is an estimation strategy to fit conditional mean models when we have repeated measures data. Uh, so in that context, it's very common to estimate variance components with the aim to increase precision. And eventually, it's very common to ignore the resulting estimation error that comes from estimating those variance components. And there's a good justification because if the conditional mean model is correct, well, then estimation of the variance components is not really affecting asymptotic inference for the mean parameters. The actual truth is that the, the mean model is very likely misspecified, and in those cases, estimating variance components will typically give rise to excess variability that we don't usually acknowledge in our inference. In practice, we use model building algorithms to prevent model misspecification, but the use of these algorithms is likewise problematic for multiple reasons. One is that the typical algorithms that, you, that we use in practice are designed to give us good predictions. They're not necessarily designed to give us low bias or, or low imprecision in, in the parameter estimator of interest. And second, and perhaps more importantly, the standard inference that we employ has been designed for settings where we have a pre-specified model. If we use the data to select a model, then that will typically give rise to excess variability that we don't acknowledge in our inference. In fact, on the repeated sampling, each time, each time we analyze a new uh, sample from the same population, we may end up choosing a different model, and this is leading to additional heterogeneity. And the picture shows this to some extent. So here you can see what, how the estimator here of the effect of interest would be distributed if we always pick model one. Um, so that would be sitting around zero, which is the, the truth in this case. If we always pick model two, then we have an estimator that follows the blue distribution, and so it's biased, but a bit more precise. Um, but when we use the data to, to help us decide which model to pick, then in some data sets, we will uh, go for uh, model one, in some data sets, we'll go for model two. And so eventually we see this um, mixture distribution, which indicates that the estimator has bias. It has more variability than had we picked one model. Uh, in the first place, and, and uh, we have this deviation from the usual normal distribution. The final point I want to make about standard statistical modeling is uh, what Breiman called the multiplicity of good models. We have a reasonable awareness that different models may fit the data nearly equally well in practice, that if we use different strategies for building a model, that uh, different strategies may lead to, to different models, but they may all be fitting the data almost equally well. And 
that in itself suggests that inferring the actual data generating mechanism is a very ambitious and overly ambitious undertaking. Despite this, in practice, it's very common that we end up selecting a single model and then interpret it as if it were representing the true data generating mechanism. And that can obviously lead to mistaken interpretations. Each of these problems that I mentioned, I think, is really serious. But in spite of it, largely ignored in practice, even by most professional statisticians. And we should not be surprised about it because it's very much present in our teaching. In our teaching, we warn students that all models are wrong, but that at the end of the day, we teach them to assume a single model and to draw inference as if the fitted model was the correct one. We typically warn students that the inference that we provide is assuming that the model was pre-specified, but at the end of the day, we teach them to make use of model building procedures and then ignore the fact that this is uh, inducing excess variability in the results. Moreover, the procedures for model building that we usually teach are aimed at prediction, regardless of whether the scientific question is really about prediction. And then finally, we, we usually warn students that multiple models may fit the data equally well, but at the end of the day, we still teach them to pick one and pretend as if that is representing the data generating mechanism. So I think that's really problematic. And the question that we therefore had is if we can do better. Well, we can do better by no longer using models to summarize the data. And that's what happens in the literature on non-parametric estimates, which is very much used in causal inference today. In causal inference, uh, one estimate, one effect measure, if you like, or one functional of the data distribution that's very popular to focus on is this mean of Y1, Y1 being a counterfactual outcome that indicates for a given subject what the outcome would be if that individual was treated. So here I'm focusing on what would be the average outcome in the population if everyone were treated. And under typical causal assumptions, we can relate this to the observed data by first taking the expected outcome Y in the subgroup of people who were treated. I will label those A equal one, where A um, refers to a treatment. And an L could be a collection of confounders sufficient to control for the effects of A on Y. So I first evaluate this conditional expectation. You could say I'm first predicting how the outcome would look like for each person if that person was treated, and then we average this across all people. This is what I call a non-parametric estimate. It's a, a functional of the observed data distribution that is not tied to a specific model, and we can develop non-parametric inference for it based on the so-called efficiency influence function, and Oliver will talk about that later today. It turns out that by, by developing non-parametric inference for this particular estimate, we, we can basically address all previous concerns, I would say primarily by no longer um, working with an estimate, uh, a coefficient, an, an effect measure that is tied to a specific model. The approach is still relating to models, it's still making use of models. In particular, it requires modeling the expected outcome in the treated with given covariates, and it's also uh, modeling or require, requiring models for the probability of being treated given L. But the good news is that this modeling can um, be done based on very flexible data adaptive strategies, even using machine learning, uh, hoping that we can in this way prevent bias. And no matter how complicated the models we use for this, the end result remains as simple as the expected outcome in the population if everyone were treated. And, and so the, the point I want to make here is that uh, we are sort of resolving Occam's dilemma. We are reducing the risk of model misspecification. And the fact that we rely on this non-parametric theory uh, also means that we can get valid inference in spite of the use of machine learning or, or model selection. And, and again, Oliver will, will say more about this point. So in summary, this approach is still using modeling, but only to handle the cursor dimensionality, only to learn how the outcome relates to confounders or how the exposure relates to confounders. But it's not using models to summarize the information in the data, and that gives it a strength. But the fact that there is no longer um, real use of modeling 
in, in the way that we are used to, I think is also a weakness of the approach. It has frequently led people to dichotomize exposures because the framework of uh, working with non-parametric estimates is less well developed for continuous exposures. And so there may be a focus on questions like what if everyone in the population were obese? There has been some work on continuous exposures, but also that may lead to asking dubious questions like what if everyone had a BMI of 25? And as the analysis gets more complicated, for instance, because of dealing with continuous exposures or time varying exposures, it's very common to eventually return to standard modeling. And this is what happens, uh, for instance, in the context of so-called marginal structure models, which are very popular in, um, in causal inference today. The key questions that we therefore had is, can we somehow still make use of models? but only with the aim to summarize the information in the data while still relying on very flexible data adaptive modeling strategies, perhaps machine learning to ensure valid inference. And second, can we also ensure that if the model that we use to summarize the information, if that model turns out to be misspecified, can we make sure that we are still capturing what we care about, uh, the association between exposure and outcome given covariates. Can we make sure that we still capture this in a well understood way? So this is a, a bit of an overview of the approach that we will uh, attempt to, uh, to develop. We'll propose an approach basically to estimate main effects and interaction parameters in a generalized linear model. It's going to make use of flexible modeling strategies or machine learning in the background, if you like, in order to prevent bias. But the inference that we will provide are going to be valid in spite of the use of these data adaptive modeling strategies, these very flexible um, strategies where we try to learn the model based on data and, and where the model is not pre-specified. And the inference is also going to be valid even when the generalized linear model I'm going to make use of um, is misspecified because I'm only going to relate to this model as a way of summarizing the information in the data, as a way of approximating the association between exposure and outcome. Um, but I want my inference to be valid and meaningful even if, it, if that model is wrong. So to give you a, a bit of an idea, suppose we have a dichotomous outcome, then I may choose deliberately to work with the log link in the generalized linear model, because if I work with the log link, then that helps me to summarize the conditional association between exposure and outcome given L on the relative risk scale, which is convenient. And we may also deliberately choose to leave out interactions between the exposure and the covariates, again, because perhaps our interest is in the main exposure effects and, and much less so in the interactions. So we may deliberately go for certain simplifying choices because the inference that we will provide is going to be valid in a sense that I'll clarify even when this model is misspecified. We wanted the approach to have a couple of features. We wanted it to connect really well to applied practice so that we can overcome the aforementioned concerns, like uh, uh, we, we did not want to dichotomize exposures necessarily just to sort of fit in the framework. This is why we've chosen to work with the successful class of generalized linear models where people are very familiar with. So the parameters that we will estimate, they will have the usual interpretation when the specified GLM holds, but when the model is misspecified, uh, they can still be safely interpreted in the usual way. So we've designed the approach such that even when the model is wrong, that this uh, log relative risk interpretation here, for instance, is still meaningful. And again, I'll, I'll clarify this in a moment. We wanted the approach to have a lot of flexibility, uh, just like in GLMs in particular, the modeling of continuous or dichotomous exposures. We sort of wanted that to be as easy. And finally, we wanted the approach to avoid gross extrapolations uh, so that it can safely be used also by non-experts. So in particular, we wanted to avoid inverse weighting by densities um, as, as sometimes and in fact often arises in causal inference when dealing with continuous exposures. So I'm going to walk you through the sort of the key elements of the proposal um, and then then Oliver will uh, will talk about how exactly we do the inference. 
the key principle, which is inspired by many others, um, is to construct a non-parametric S demand, but one that basically reduces to a well-known parameter um, beta, for instance, in this generalized linear model where G is, is the link function that we're going to work with. So if the model holds, um, I want the S demand basically to reduce to that number beta, if you like. If that model holds, well, then beta is clearly well defined. But um, if we stick with this model, then, then beta has no clear meaning when the model is wrong. And that's basically why in standard parametric modeling, it's usually so hard to come up with infer inferential theories that allow for model selection. Because if we deal with model selection, we are changing the model all the time. It's very likely that some of the models will be misspecified. And in misspecified models, we cannot really assign a clear meaning to the parameters in, in that model. So that's why we're going to work with a non-parametric estimant, one that has meaning even if this model does not make sense. Oops. So a natural starting point to, to achieve this, a natural starting point to come up with a non-parametric definition for beta is to use so-called projections. That is, we could view beta or define beta as the minimizer of some distance measure, like the minimizer of the kullback leibler divergence under a certain parameterization of what I call omega L. So this is like the, the main effect of the covariates in this model. We could do that technically, uh, but also that approach seems to be unsatisfactory because if the model is misspecified, then it's usually not so clear how to interpret this projection as demand. And also there's not really a guarantee that it captures the conditional association of interest when the model is misspecified. And let me just make these two points clear with one specific example. So imagine we have a dichotomous exposure and I'm going to work with a linear regression for the outcome. Well then this reasoning with projection, um, if we make like an ordinary least squares projection um, so we project the actual distribution of the data onto this linear model. Well, then if you work out what is the meaning of the resulting estimate for beta, then it turns out to be this particular expression. The first term is, is sort of um, reassuring. It's like a weighted average of the mean difference in outcome between the treated and the untreated people with the same covariate data L and the weights uh, relate to the probability pi L of being treated, and this one minus pi tilde of L, well, pi tilde of L is the population least squares projection of the exposure on the covariates. This, is, this expression is rather disturbing. First of all, it's a very complicated expression, so it's not really helping us very much to, give, to, to assign a clear interpretation to the parameter in that model. Uh, it, with nonlinear models, it would even be much more complicated, and more importantly, uh, even though the first component tells us something about the conditional association between A and Y given L, the second component is more about the extent to which the true probability of being treated deviates from this linear regression relation, and that's not really about the conditional association of interest. So we don't really have a guarantee with this projection approach that we're sort of getting something that we're hoping to get. So how can we do better? Well. As I said before, we're going to use generalized linear models, but only with the aim to summarize the information in the data. And so to clearly separate this from modeling to address the curse of dimensionality, we found it helpful to start from the setting where someone already told us how the mean outcome looks like at each level of the exposure A and each covariate at level L that is feasible or that we can observe. Suppose someone gave this to us then still that would be too much information to share with people. And so we would like to summarize uh, the dependence of that expectation on A. One way how we can do this is for each stratum, we might summarize the association in terms of a population least squares coefficient. Uh, and that one looks like this. So it's like a, if you do a, a least squares regression of the expected outcome on the scale of the link function G, regressing it on the exposure within the given stratum. Well, then what we find um, is beta L. At the moment, I'm still thinking we have infinitely many data because I'm, I'm trying to come up with a definition um, for the association between exposure and outcome. 
if this model here were to hold, so it's like a generalized linear model, but we have a stratum specific coefficient. If this model holds, um, then um, beta L here in this expression is reducing exactly to the same number. But if that model is misspecified, then beta L is still capturing the association of interest because it's like a, a least squares projection. So this could be one stratum of people here. On the y-axis, you can see the expected outcome on the scale of the link function. Maybe the true relation is sort of the, uh, the curved relationship over here. And I'm summarizing this by a least square slope. Uh, and that slope is what I call beta L. In, an, in another stratum, this might be how um, the, um, the data generating mechanism looks like. And again, we sort of uh, approximate the true uh, dependence between ex the expected outcome and A by a least squares regression slope. At the end of the day, for each stratum, we may have another beta L. And so eventually we see a distribution of estimates beta L. And we've chosen to summarize that distribution. In the paper, we will focus on the central location um, in such a way that the summary that we report at the end of the day will agree with the coefficient beta in this model, where we have this time a constant effect, uh, it will agree with that coefficient if the model holds, but hopefully still be sensible if the model is misspecified. Obviously, the more beta L varies between strata, the less appealing such a summary becomes. And so in, in future work, we, we plan to look more into the variability of beta L between strata and there's some related work by uh, Levy and others who look at variability in the average treatment effects. So in view of this, uh, one may want to, to work on a scale on which that variability is low. And, and this is partly why we allow for the use of link functions in the framework, even though strictly speaking, since the model is allowed to be misspecified, uh, we don't necessarily need to work with link functions. Now, how do we measure that central location? Well, we've chosen to work with weighted averages because those are relatively easy to communicate. Again, for each stratum, um, we, we measure the association between exposure and outcome, and I call that beta L. Um, and so we, we basically take a weighted average of those components with non-negative weights. How to choose those? Well, um, if we're interested in the causal effect, if you like, of exposure on outcome, and I think we're usually not so interested in the effect for those strata where there's not a lot of exposure variability. In intensive care, for instance, if we focus on the effect of renal replacement therapy, there's going to be a lot of patients for whom renal replacement therapy is just not an option on the table. Uh, and there may also be patients for whom, uh, who are almost guaranteed to receive renal replacement therapy based on what we know about them. For, the, for those patients, um, I don't think we're really so interested in learning the effect of renal replacement therapy on outcome because they're all, almost guaranteed to either get it or not get it. And moreover, the data don't really carry much information about the effect of the therapy. I think we're primarily interested in those patients where there is doubt, and that's where we see a lot of variability in, this, in the assigned treatment. This is why we've chosen to work with weights being proportional to the variability in the exposure as we see it in the given stratum. With this, if we focus on a dichotomous exposure, for instance, uh, the estimate basically reduces to this weighted average of these stratum specific effects, weights being the probability of being treated times the probability of being untreated. And so imagine I go back to the earlier example where we were using a log link for um, a dichotomous outcome, well, then this beta L would be like a log relative risk. So we're basically reporting weighted averages of log relative risks. This is why we, we would say that the if our um, clinical investigators, for instance, do the interpretation in the usual way as a log relative risk parameter in, in a generalized linear model, well, then that interpretation, although perhaps not entirely valid if, if the model was misspecified. I think we would still often regard it as sufficiently safe because what they end up reporting is a weighted average of log relative risks.
The use of weights as we propose it all is also designed to prevent extrapolation, which may arise when we are asking overly ambitious questions or maybe scientifically irrelevant questions. In particular, we've chosen the weights so that it avoids the need for inverse exposure density weighting, and that will appear from Oliver's part of the talk. Preventing such inverse weighting by densities turn out to be a lot harder uh, when we try to deal with effect modification. And I'll maybe just give a, a quick impression uh, of how we handle effect modification before handing over the words to Oliver. So uh, I'll just explain the proposal in the case where we have two conditionally independent exposures, A1 and A2, um, given L. So suppose I have two exposures that are conditionally independent, conditional on the other covariates in the data. Then here I'll explain how we try to come up with um, a measure of effect modification that we can then try to estimate. Here is how we can do that in each covariate stratum um, defined by the first exposure and the covariates. We can basically summarize the association between the outcome and the second exposure in exactly the way I explained before. So we can, we can do a population least squares regression of the expected outcome on the scale of the link function where we regress it on the second exposure. If we had infinitely many data, then we could do that in each stratum separately. And then in each stratum A1L, we would find a coefficient beta of A1 and L. Then next, um, in each covariate stratum L, I would summarize the association between the coefficients that we just identified and the first exposure to see how strongly Basically, the effect of A2, if you like, depends on, on the other exposure, A1. Again, we can do that in exactly the way I explained before. So we do a population least squares regression of this coefficient, beta A1 and L, onto the first exposure. And that gives us a coefficient, beta, which is stratum dependent. So it's a function of L. And at the end of the day, we take a weighted average of those coefficients. Um, with weights that would be large and straighter that have a lot of variability in both exposures. Uh, the framework in the paper um, handles um, F, the notion of effect modification much more generally, but I'm, I'm just uh, giving you here a snapshot of, uh, of how that would work in the specific case of conditionally independent exposures. Before handing over the words, um, I'll maybe hear if there's any questions. No questions? Okay, then maybe I'll hand over the words. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Stan. Um, okay, so Stan is really uh, given some detail on how we can construct a model-free estimant. The next question naturally is, how can we go about estimating this from a given data set? So in order to simplify the, the discussion that follows, I'm going to focus on this estimant, the expected conditional covariance that's given on the slide. So this is actually very closely related to our es chosen estimant. It's equal to the numerator of our estimant. Um, when G, this link function, is the identity link. So it's quite tempting, since this is a, our estimand is just a, a functional of, of quantities um, uh, that involve the, the observed data distribution, to just estimate it via its empirical analog, which is this uh, sample average that I, that I give at the bottom of the slide. Of course, we outside of a randomized trial, we often don't know in advance the conditional mean of A given L. So one might be tempted to then plug in an estimate of this quantity. Now we might do this using by fitting uh, standard regression models, but in the in the spirit of being assumption lean, it's also possible to use flexible 
uh, data adaptive statistical learning or, or machine learning type estimators. So this estimator where we've plugged in this uh, estimate of the, the conditional mean of A, I'm going to call the plug-in estimator. But using the plug-in estimator in general is a, is a bad idea. And this is for two reasons. The first reason is, is maybe an obvious one. If we're using machine learning to get our predictions, the conditional mean of A is that we can easily obtain estimates, but we have no idea in general how close these estimates are to the truth. So um, many statistical learning uh, estimators have a complex distribution. Uh, and we don't often don't know their statistical properties, and uh, therefore it's not general, uh, generally clear how to account for the uncertainty they bring to an, an analysis. Uh, it's also therefore not clear how their uncertainty propagates into the standard error of the estimator of our target parameter, um, which we wish to report on. Furthermore, it's tempting to consider the bootstrap, but in general this has no justification, and this is because the data adaptive estimators of this conditional mean are usually non-regular. The second concern uh, is a slightly more subtle one and involves this notion of plug-in bias. So we know that data adaptive estimators are in general, uh, they're well, uh, at least in their standard implementation, are designed to balance bias and variance um, in a specific way that is, is meant to obtain really good predictions for new individuals uh, with similar values uh, of the of similar data as in the, the, the training sample. However, these data adaptive estimators are usually not um, tailored towards delivering low bias in estimates of the target parameter, in this case, the expected conditional covariance. So to give an example of this, suppose that I uh, select a model for the conditional mean of A based on variable selection. Then the standard um, stepwise selection methods are going to prioritize variables that uh, uh, predict A very well, and they can throw out variables that are um, weakly associated with A, but are strongly associated with, uh, with the outcome Y. But in a causal inference problem where, where A is an intervention of interest and Y is the outcome, this can result in eliminating important confounders of the AY relationship and thus the resulting analysis where we've thrown out these, these variables can be prone to, to residual confounding bias. Now, uh, asymptotic theory in mathematical statistics actually gives us a way of estimating the plug-in bias. So for this, this parameter, the expected conditional covariance, and we know how to, to estimate the plug-in bias using this formula given on the slide. And this involves an estimate, an additional data adaptive estimate of the conditional mean of Y given L. So once we've calculated the bias, or at least estimated it, uh, it suggests a simple way to then remove bias from the plug-in estimator. So we can just subtract the estimated bias from the initial plug-in estimate. And to give a bit of intuition about why this works, suppose that uh, this conditional mean of, of Y is obtained also through variable selection. Well, this may give us a chance to pick up variables that were mistakenly ejected from the model for A, um, which, which are nevertheless important confounders that we wish to adjust for in our analysis. OK, so that's an example of, of, of one specific estimate, but we actually have a much more generic recipe in order to calculate plug-in bias. And the insight from the literature here is that the, the plug-in bias is driven by the minus the sample average of the estimands efficient influence function. So the key step to calculating the plug-in bias is calculating the efficient influence function. So in the case of the general main effects estimand that we give in the main paper, um, what we want to do is we, we want to develop an estimator which basically sets the sample average of the uh, efficient influence function to zero, because this kind of estimator by setting the sample average to zero is gonna be removing the plug-in bias. So the estimator that does this is given in closed form on the slide, and it looks pretty complicated. Um, this, U, uh, this mu uh, term involves calculation of, of, of several conditional expectations, but once we've obtained these uh, and we, we, we propose to do this 
also using data adaptive methods, then the estimator of our, our target can in fact be implemented using least squares software. So once one has uh, obtained this mu, we can regress it uh, using least squares on this residual for A uh, and ask for there not to be an intercept included. And this is a, a simple way to, to implement this method. Now, of course, this estimator involves quite a few unknown conditional expectations, and we're proposing to substitute these by estimates. Now, of course, we've talked about how to remove plug-in bias using the efficient influence function. The question is then, well, how do we account for the uncertainty that comes from data adaptive estimation of the nuisance parameters, which are these conditional expectations? Well, kind of the, the maybe the most special property of the of the efficient influence function is that estimators that are based on it uh, will tend to behave similarly at least in very large samples to an oracle estimator so this oracle estimator will use the true uh, known conditional expectations uh, of, of of y and a so the fact that uh, our estimator in very large samples behaves similarly to this oracle estimator means which where the nuisance parameters are known rather than estimators means that when we do inference we we can actually ignore uh, that the that the, how the nuisance parameters were estimated so we actually have a, a simple formula for calculating the variance of our estimator as one over n times the sample variance of the the efficient influence function pretending that the conditional expectations were, were given rather than estimated and this uh, this result is, it doesn't depend um, under certain conditions, at least, on how we estimate these conditional expectations, whether we use parametric regression or much more flexible machine learning methods. Now, in order to get a valid estimate of the variance, uh, you can actually also do this using least squares software by just requesting a robust standard error. So maybe this all seems a little bit too, uh, yeah, too, too clean, um, given that I'm proposing to bring in these kind of more, more flexible methods. And, and it's true that when very flexible machine learning algorithms are used, in general, sample splitting or cross-fitting should be used. So the, the estimates of, the, of these conditional expectations should usually be estimated from a separate sample to the one used to draw inference on the target parameter. So by doing this, we're removing additional bias, um, which is due to overfitting the, uh, the learners. Furthermore, we're also uh, assuming that our learners are converging sufficiently fast to the truth. And in, in order for this to be the case, we require several assumptions. So one is that the, the tuning parameters are chosen well, but we also require that assumptions like smoothness and sparsity hold. So uh, in general, in the case where there are many covariates, uh, we, we, we generally require that in truth, the true condition expectations will only involve, involve a small number of them. So these kind of assumptions are, are generally weaker than the, the, the standard assumptions in, in parametric statistical uh, theory, but they're still non-negligible, okay? And they, they can maybe be viewed as very strong in cases when we have a very high dimensional uh, covariates. Uh, and this, for this reason, we, we've entitled our paper "Assumption Lean Inference" rather than "Assumption Free," because, of course, we're always we're always bringing in, uh, at least under the under the hood, we're bringing in these assumptions regarding uh, smoothness and, and sparsity. So, um, we evaluated our, our proposed estimators in in a couple of simulation studies. So that the first example looked at uh, log logistic regression. So in this case, we generated a, a 10 dimensional uh, covariate L. A, a was Bernoulli distributed, uh, and it's uh, based on this logistic regression I, model I show on the slide with this quadratic term for one of the covariates L1. So we contrasted uh, our proposed estimator um, where we used random forests for estimation of all these nuisance parameters with a maximum likelihood estimator, which is obtained from just uh, regressing, regressing um, from a standard uh, logistic regression, uh, which is assumed to be linear on the log odd say on the log odd scale in A and L. 
Okay, so in the first case, the logistic regression, the parametric logistic regression model that sort of underpinned the maximum likelihood estimator was, was correctly specified. So the, this equation at the top uh, is, shows the true data generating process. And we see that in that case, the proposal is doing uh, comparatively well, uh, both in terms of coverage, also in, and also in terms of efficiency, it's actually doing a little bit better in efficiency um, to, the, to the maximum likelihood estimator, which would be viewed as the, the gold standard in such an analysis. We're doing slightly better in, in terms of efficiency, but, but that's a bit of a, an artifact of the setting. So in a case where the, uh, in the true data generating model that's at the top of the slide here, there's now a quadratic term uh, in the uh, true uh, logistic model. But in the fitted model, uh, that we, we, we admitted such a term so that the maximum likelihood estimator as a result of ignoring the misspecification is doing, doing pretty badly with coverage that tends quickly to, to zero with sample size. In, com in contrast, our proposal um, was, is having cover has coverage which, although is, 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 is maybe not great at 500, is getting better as sample size increases. In a second simulation study, we, we, considered, we looked at the uh, measures of association for effect modification. So again, A was, 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 uh, was binary, and we were interested in assessing effect modification between A and uh, continuous covariate L3. Now, in the true data generating mechanism, there was, in truth, an interaction between A and L1 and L2. So it was a kind of a complex interaction but there was no interaction between A and L3 in the true uh, data generating process. So the truth can therefore be considered to be zero in this case. Now, the results based on least squares or the, the MLE fitting a linear regression with uh, an interaction between A and L, um, you see that the, the coverage is doing getting, getting worse and worse with sample size. Uh, and this is due to the, the fact that its model is misspecified whereas the proposal tended to have uh, generally improved, quite, quite dramatically improved coverage. Now, we made the situation even harder by uh, including this extra interaction in the true data generating model between A and L6, and L6 and L3 were highly correlated. So it's actually very difficult to, um, to tell that, that there's in truth no in, uh, in effect modification uh, with respect to A and L3. And, and, and because it was a much harder setting, we saw that the MLE had approximately zero coverage across all uh, sample sizes. So it's, like I said, it's a difficult setting, so we had pretty bad coverage at, at low sample sizes, but this improved as, as N got larger. All right, so the principles of, of building an analysis around a model-free estimand is is, is certainly not completely new. So it's really at the heart of the targeted learning theory and the literature on, on TMLE. Uh, and, and it's also been the focus of uh, parallel developments um, in, in mathematical statistics, uh, also now in the post-selection inference and higher dimensional statistics literature. And some of these are touched upon in this recent discussion paper by uh, Buya et al. So, in general, there's kind of two strands to this, this idea of starting with a, a model-free estimand. The first strand kind of comes from the causal inference literature, where we, we choose an estimand that's very specific, linked to a specific causal question. Um, whereas in the other strand, uh, we, we maybe choose an estimand based on the limits of standard parametric estimators. And these are generally much less specific in the sense that they sort of generic for different exposures, but but maybe uh, much harder to interpret under misspecification. So in our work, we've attempted to take the best of both. We work with generic estimands that are connected to routinely used models, but are also interpretable when the model is wrong. And in comparison with some of these other projection parameters, are guaranteed to summarize the association of interest. OK, so. Stain uh, began the talk with discussing the, the concerns regard, regarding standard practice. Have we overcome them? Well, we feel that the proposal overcomes Occam's dilemma because we've separately uh, select, we, se we separated 
the uh, the modeling required to select an S-demand by, by choosing this model-free S-demand uh, before seeing the data. So the modeling assumptions that are brought in to handle the curse of dimensionality in, in order to deal with confounding or, or censoring, etc. We've hoped to prevent model misspecification bias because we uh, incorporate more flexible modeling methods, uh, including uh, machine learning tools. Uh, by working under a non parametric model and doing inference under this model, we avoid extracting information from modeling assumptions that maybe uh, that maybe have no scientific basis. Uh, this this um, framework for inference also facilitates valid uh, calculation of standard errors, even when we use machine learning tools, variable selection or model selection. So rather than trying to infer the entire data generating process by demanding a set, uh, we we really tailor each of our analyses to a, to our specific exposure of interest. And we 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 feel that this approach. It much makes the the pre-specification of an entire analysis much easier because you can you can pre-specify your your model-free estimate and then for actually how you do the modeling you can use these more data adaptive tools that you can specify in your protocol or or maybe even on an ensemble learner to choose between the different candidate learners connecting back to the real world so this proposal doesn't necessarily make the uh, the the implementation or the certainly the reporting and translation of the generalized linear model analysis more complicated because the usual interpretation of GLMs remains valid when the model holds and we're sort of trying to capture a safe approximation when the model is misspecified. Um, the automated data adaptive methods uh, can lessen the burden of having to sort of do model checking uh, and make it more objective and easy, easier to pre-specify. Um, and therefore, the efforts of the data analysts can rather be spent, well, firstly, on, on, on choosing an, an estimate, but also on making sanity checks such as outlier detection. Even when data adaptive algorithms are limited to stepwise parametric regression, and one is not interested in, in bringing in more sort of black box learners, we, our framework, I think, is still very useful here because the resulting standard errors are going to be much more honest by acknowledging the, the model uncertainty uh, that, that comes in the selection process. While the standard uh, theoretic, well, the, the theoretical framework that I, I've discussed in this second part of the talk uh, involves non-parametric theory and then, and then perhaps complicated, more complex ideas from, from functional analysis and so on, this doesn't necessarily mean that the that, that one needs to know the theory in order to make successful use of the, of the proposal. So something sort of similar is that Cox regression, the, the theoretical uh, underpinning of, of the Cox model, relies on Martingale theory, which is similarly complicated to the, the non-parametrics. But one doesn't need to be an expert in this in order to, to report results from a, a Cox model. So we hope we've succeeded to improve applied practice through this work and as well as further development on other model classes and the availability of software. All right, so thank you very much for uh, yeah, listening to both of us talk. Uh, here are some references, including this for those interested in the, the discussion on, um, on non parametric inference. I, this paper, the first paper, is recently added to archive. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to, to take some further questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, both of you. Um, does anybody have any questions? You can indicate by raising your hand in, in using the emoji or or writing in the chat. Right in the chat. OK, if there are no questions, then let's, let's thank, thank the authors, authors again. again. Um, and we'll see you both at the discussion meeting later. OK, thank you very much. Thank you.